Let's begin with the word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We come at this time of prayer into your hands. We seek your guidance as to how to pray. I pray that you'll lead us and guide us to the truth of who you are, what is this Christian life all about, and how we should pray. Pray that you will inspire us, lead us, and guide us in this prayer, O oh God. That prayer may be the prayer that comes from your heart, that contains your desires, your vision. And we pray that Jesus will be glorified, people will be changed, we will be changed, and your purposes will be accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn with me to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. If you remember, the last time we talked about it, it's been quite some time, and we haven't seen you all in such a long time, it looks like. But the last time we talked about it, we were in the middle of Psalm 78, which is a very long psalm, about 72 words. Right? And this psalm, if you remember, is about lessons from Israel's history. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, we read that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. It's referring to the Old Testament scriptures. It says that it is written and preserved and handed over to us in order to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So it is there to teach us, to make us to endure through difficult times, and also to encourage us. We all need that, right? We all need teaching. We need to be told things. We need to be guided. We all need it. No matter how old we are, how young we are, we need God's guidance, teaching all the time. Teaching is very valuable. We all need endurance to go through difficult times. Difficult times in life are part of life in this fallen world. The world is not a very good world. It is an evil world with evil people. Eh? So evil things happen all the time to good people. Eh? That's a lesson the Bible teaches. Some people say, if you're good, good things only will happen. If you're evil, evil things will happen. Well, it's not as simple as that. I know if you sow evil things, you will reap evil things. If you sow good things, you will reap good things. But it is more complicated than that, really. Sometimes good people end up experiencing evil things in life. The greatest example in the Bible is Job. And so we all need endurance and encouragement, and that is why the Old Testament has been written. That's what Paul is saying there in Romans. Now Psalm 78 is one such psalm that teaches us a lot of things. It is written by a man named Asaph, and it teaches us some valuable truth. The very first thing that it tells us is the importance of the past. We read that from verse 1 to 8. I've already taught on that. The importance of the past. How your past is very important and that you need to have some way to preserve your past experiences and pass it on to your children. Deuteronomy 6 tells us how to write down the Bible verses and hang them all over the walls and the children will ask questions based on that. And you answer them, explain to them, and so on. There must be a way to pass it on to the next generation. We must instruct our children the past and the past experiences, the miracles and great things that God has done must be remembered, recorded, and passed on to the people of the next generation. Are you doing that? Every family must do that. We must preserve it. We must leave some wonderful memories of what God has done. Your children, your grandchildren must be able to tell 
what God has done in your life, the amazing things that God has done in your life, because you have told them, because you have praised God before them. You have lifted up and glorified God before them, right? The second thing is 9 to 16. Verse 9 to 16 is the second stanza, if you say, if you look at it as a psalm. It shows how the people of Israel behaved. God provided for their needs abundantly, but those people always were dissatisfied. No matter how well God provided their needs, they were dissatisfied. Verse 9 talks about how the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. So it's talking about the children of Ephraim and their behavior. They turned back on the day of battle. Eh? And uh, we don't know what it's referring to because the exact same thing is not found in the Bible. The incidence is not recorded in the Bible, but it's referred to here. It is some, something that happened there that in the battle they turned back. And uh, therefore, that passage says, God rejected Ephraim as the tribe out of which the great and enduring kingship of David should come. And chose rather the tribe of Judah and, uh, and from the tribe of Judah comes the great king David and his throne is established forever. It's a lesson to learn. It's a lesson to learn. When you live an unbelieving life, when you live a rebellious life, there are consequences for that. The Ephraim was put aside and Judah was exalted. At the time of the invasion of Canaan, Ephraim was the largest and most prominent of the 12 tribes. But by the time of the writing of Psalm 78, Judah had become greater than Ephraim. God has exalted Judah, see. Faith has its rewards. If you act by faith, God will reward you. If you go where God tells you to go, do what God tells you to do, certainly God will reward you. God will bless you. Yeah? There is a blessing. You should not draw back from the battle in this world. The world is full of battle. How many of you got faith for the battle <laughs> to face the problems? Yeah? If you draw back then you've got a lot to lose. If you stand by faith in the calling which God has given to you and continue in it and to be faithful to God and act by faith, God will certainly reward you and bless you. Amen? When the man saw the battle, he withdrew. He ran, drew back. It's a refusal to believe in God. What a shame after seeing all that God has done after experiencing all the miracles, after experiencing all that God had done in that tribe's life and in that nation's life, they should have stood. They should have battled and uh, honored God by their faith, but they failed. All right, then the third set, that also we considered already. The third section also is something we considered. That is verse 17 to 31, okay? The third section is about how that uh, they were reminded of God's judgments, but it only produced false repentance. Eh? False repentance. How do we know? We know that the people were dissatisfied with what God has done, wanting more. Secondly, they thought the reason that God did not give them everything they wanted was because they, that he could not. That God could not do that. In other words, their sins were first ingratitude for what God had done. And the second sin was unbelief. In both these things, they put God to test. By doing these things, with their ingratitude and with their unbelief, they put God to test. Remember when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness? The devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple. He said, 
jump from here. And he quoted Psalm 91 to Jesus. He said, the angels of God will come and bear you up before your feet hit the ground. Because the Bible says so. The devil is speaking Bible, you know. The devil knows the Bible. <laughs> and what did Jesus say to the devil? He said, do not test the Lord your God. That is there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Don't test the Lord your God. What they did was exactly testing the Lord their God, you know. They were dissatisfied with what God has done. Plus, they couldn't believe that God can do, give them the things that they needed. They doubted God's ability, God's faithfulness, and all of that. And they had abundance of blessing. That is what Asaph tells us here in verse 24 and all. Look at how he talks about it. You know, talks about first their unbelief, their ingratitude. And then in verse 24, he says, he rained down manna on them to eat. <laughs> He's a God who can meet your need beyond anything that you can think about. Rain down manna. That means just poured it out. These people thought, we are in the wilderness. What are we going to do? What are we going to eat? Is God going to be able to do that? Are we going to die, they said. But God poured down like rain, manna from heaven. Amazing. You know, have you experienced God's blessings like that? You thought God could never do it. God could not meet your small need. But God just rains down manna from heaven. Yeah. Given them the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full, verse 25 says. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by the power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas. <laughs> in the wilderness, how could you supply meat? See, they wanted meat. They said, wow, oh, we've been eating meat. We're non-vegetarians, you know. You've made us vegetarians by bringing in the wilderness. Now we're eating only manna. How many days can we stand this vegetarian diet? <laughs> Uh, will you be able to give us meat? <laughs> Very rebellious people, you know. You give them one thing, then they say. You give them food, they say, oh, this is not good, not good enough. We want meat. God said, how much meat do you want? You know. See, they say there was about 30 lakhs people. For 30 lakhs people, how many roads you should have, how many trucks you should have, what kind of logistics are needed in order to supply meat in the wilderness? Just think about it. If you ask a logistics person today to supply meat for 30 lakhs people, I think he'll be stunned, you know. He's got to do a lot of preparations. He's got to get a lot of things going. There needs to be roads, there needs to be trucks, and how many trucks and how many tons it can carry. All that will come into, because 30 lakhs people. It's not enough if you opened a meat shop. 30 lakhs people have to eat meat. How do you supply? God did it just like that. That is where that verse comes. God's arm is not shortened. That wonderful verse comes there. You know. God is able. Our God is mighty God. What he did was, there was these fat birds out there in that area that flies, but they won't fly normally. They'll wait for the wind to blow and they'll fly with the wind, it seems. They'll wait for the wind to blow and fly with the wind. So God made the wind to blow and brought the south wind. He blew the wind in the direction of the Israeli camp. And if you read it in the place where it talks about it, it says that the distance of a one-day walk on each side. That's how long was covered with these birds. These birds that were fat birds that were sitting lazy, waiting for the wind. The wind came and blew to the area, towards the area that the Israelis were camped. And they took off and started flying. And when they came near the Israeli camp, the wind stopped, so they landed. And the Bible says, if you read the story, it says, the birds were stacked up for one day's walking distance, which they say is 40 kilometers. One day's walking distance, 
and uh, three feet high, like this high. Forty kilometers this way, forty kilometers the other way, uh, stacked up. God says, "You want more? Is that enough?" You know. Our God is a mighty God. How many of you believe that our God can supply our needs no matter what? It's a very simple thing for God. It's a humongous thing for us always. Everything is big. <laughs> we are stunned by every need. We are shocked by everything, the, every development, and and we are worried about how we're going to deal with this. But God can do things in an amazing way. How many of you believe that? I believe that. I stand here as a testimony to what God can do. All these years I've experienced God's miracles in amazing, amazing ways. I believe that God can meet every one of our needs. You should never test God. You should never question God's ability to meet your need. You should never be rebellious in that way. You should never have ingratitude. You should always think about God, His greatness, His goodness, and appreciate it. No matter what your problem is, what you're going through, it doesn't matter. You need to praise God and worship God because He's great. He's above all these things, and He can do things amazingly and wonderfully. It is nothing big for Him. He's got some plan. He's got some way to get things done. Amen. Now we talked about until that point there in verse nineteen. He says, "See how they test God. Look at what they spoke. They tested God in their heart." Verse eighteen by asking for food of their fancy, <laughs> like a restaurant they're ordering. Yeah. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, "Can God prepare a table in the wilderness?" Look at the way they talked. Yeah? The very talk is a rebellious talk that despises God. Then it says, verse 20, says, Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. See, God did a miracle already. If you read the stories in Exodus, you see that God brought water out of a rock. You need many more miracle than that in the wilderness. And after they drank the water, they were thirsty. They didn't think that they can get water there in the wilderness. And God miraculously provided. After they drank the water and were satisfied, they said, all right, he's given water. Can he give us something to eat? <laughs> well, for eating, manna is poured out every day, rained every day. They said, well, we have had manna, too much manna. We are tired of it. Can he give us meat? I mean, what can you do to these people? <laughs> have you seen Christians like that? I've seen Christians like that. No matter what you do for them, it's not enough. <laughs> no matter how much God does, they never fully trust God. They never fully, uh, you know, appreciate God. They're always talking about, okay, is this possible for okay, Why did God do this? Oh, why did God do that? Why didn't He do this? And why can't He do that? You know, they're always dissatisfied. Can He provide meat for His people? <laughs> The Lord heard this and he was furious. Fire was kindled against Jacob. Anger also came up against Israel because they didn't believe in God. They did not trust in his salvation. Our God is one who saves mightily. Amazingly he saves. Saves you from all your troubles. Saves you from all your problems. Saves you from everything that comes against you. He is a savior. Our God is a savior, my friend. Celebrate that Savior in the midst of your problem. If you are in the wilderness, celebrate that Savior. Rejoice over that Savior. Give thanks to that Savior. That's the way to honor God. That's the way to show your faith. That's the way to stand in faith. Praise your Savior. Give glory to your Savior in the midst of your problems, in the midst of your need. Praise your Savior. I want to practice that right now. <laughs> you want to do that? See, that's what it does to me when I read these things in the Bible. It helps me in prayer. It tells me, don't be complaining about your problems. Don't be mad-mouthing God in the midst of your problems. Yeah, everybody's got problems. <laughs> Anybody and everybody's got problems. If you're in this world, you've got problems. If you've not got the problems, that means you're already dead and you're in heaven. You know, 
you are not in this world. The world is full of problems. But in this world, God has kept us as the salt of the earth and the light of this world. We are a different kind. We praise God in the midst of problems. Shall we do that? Shall we just lift up our hearts and our hands and praise God and glorify Him and thank Him for all that He has done? He's a great and mighty God. He's a God who saves in a mighty way. There is no God that saves like this God, Nebuchadnezzar said. <laughs> oh, this God is a mighty Savior. <laughs> Oh, he can save you from the fire. He can save you from the water. He can save you from everything. He can save you. Oh, he is my savior. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for you are our savior. You are our deliverer. You are our captain and the Lord of hosts you are. You lead us in the battle. You go forward and you never withdraw. Therefore, we will never withdraw. We go forward with you, O oh God. We believe and we have faith. We march forward in spite of all the problems we face today. Oh, we give you glory, glory, glory and honor and praise, O oh God. You are mighty. No man can stand against you. Your word says that every weapon that is formed against you will not prosper. Will not prosper. Enemies will come one way and run seven ways. We thank you. The problems we face will come one way and run seven ways. In the name of Jesus, it will come one way and run seven ways. We thank you that no weapon that is formed against us will prosper. In the name of Jesus, because our God is a mighty Savior. Our God is a great Savior. Our God is mighty. Mighty, mighty, mighty. There is no God like our God. We praise you, Jesus. Oh, we praise you. We pray for people with problems here and people who are hearing us online and from their homes and wherever they are, whichever country they belong. We pray for all those people that are with us today that will be, be joining us in prayer even later on. We pray and minister to them right now in the name of Jesus. We speak life and health and strength to them, whatever they are going through. I pray that these words will reach their hearts that our God is a mighty Savior. Mighty Savior. This mighty Savior is the Lord of our homes. He is the leader. He is the captain of the hosts. Oh, we thank you, Father. We thank you. As long as you are with us, we will not fail. We will not fail. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For you cover us under the shadow of your wings. You are mighty. You can cause the wind to blow our way. Oh, the wind of God's favor, the wind of God's goodness, the wind of God's mercy, the good wind that brings in every need that we have, the wind that needs every need, that brings every need. It blows our way. In the name of Jesus, may the wind of God blow. May the miracles of God happen. Oh, may it come from the north, south, east, and west. Every need be provided in the name of Jesus. Much more than enough, like you rained manna from heaven. And like the birds were flown in from all sides to the people of Israel. Forty kilometers long on each side. Three feet in depth. More than anybody could eat. Thirty lakhs people you supplied meat abundantly, abundantly, abundantly. We thank you for providing our needs abundantly, providing for us abundantly. You are more than enough. You know our needs. You know our problems. You know our challenges. Thank you for there is abundant strength for every need. Thank you for there is abundant money for every need. Thank you for there is abundant health for every challenge. Thank you for there is abundant courage for every situation. Abundance in the name of Jesus. There is abundance. God of abundance is in the midst of us. Oh, we thank you, Father. Mighty God, we praise you. Thank you for your abundance. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the wind of your favor flowing towards us, landing on us, oh, covering us. And it is more than enough, much more than enough, much more than enough. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you. Every supply is on the way. Everything that we need is on the way. Thank you for everything will be done in the most amazing manner. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. You know, verse 31 says, The wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck the choice men of Israel. In other words, those who did not believe God and stand in faith, and rebelled against God and bad mouthed God and took God for granted again and again. This is not the first time. They tested God ten times in the wilderness, just in the wilderness. Ten times. I've preached on it here. Each time they tested and how they tested and what happened. They perished. They perished. I don't want to perish, I want to live. I want to live. I want to enter into God's blessings. I want to enter into the land of milk and honey. <laughs> I want to possess all that God has for me. I don't want to perish in the way. I don't want to drop dead in the way. I want to make it all the way. I want to go all the way with God. I want to see all that God has for me and experience all that God has for me. How many of you are ready for that? Just lift up your hands and thank God. Praise God. Remember, never, never, never speak against God. Never, never open your mouth and do that, you know. Never speak unbelieving words. Never. Believe and speak those things. Even in the midst of the most difficult problems, speak God's word. Speak the goodness of God. The mercy and the grace of God. Speak it. Speak it. Speak it. Speak it. Celebrate the goodness of God. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your goodness, your favor, your kindness is upon us. Thank you. You're raining down your favor upon us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. For you do things that man cannot do. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, what an amazing God we have. Eh? See, this is how to pray. We are also, remember, we are also learning to pray, right? <laughs> you should never forget that. Friday nights is a time where we not only pray, we are teaching our church people to pray. One of the jobs of the church is to teach its people to pray. There's a lot of people out there in the church of Jesus Christ that don't know how to pray. I remember many years ago when we had a meeting here, when we first came in here and put a pandal, and under that we were having meetings, people from all over have come, it's a big conference, the morning meeting, I got up and said, let's pray. It was a praying session and I was conducting prayer, I said, let's pray. And everybody went like this and started, oh, they started crying, you know. I said, everybody sit up straight. <laughs> I said, let's pray. I didn't say, let's cry. I said, let's pray. <laughs> I sometimes think that people think that praying is crying. <laughs> no, no, praying is not crying. Praying is remembering God's goodness, kindness, greatness, rejoicing over God. Speaking by faith, that's what prayer is. Prayer is that you come before God and you worship and praise and, you know, just think of going before a king who has all power to do every good thing to you and he can do anything he wants. He's got all power and you're going before him. There is a king in the world like that. If you went before him, will you be bad-mouthing him? <laughs> will you be... Complaining about your problems? No. You'll go before him and you'll tell him what you need. You'll praise him. You'll worship him. Glorify him. Amen? That's exactly what we need to do. We are coming face to face with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
He is mighty to save. He is the great savior. There is no one that saves like him. You are facing him. So be careful what you say. You, you may have a lot of problems, but you rejoice over his goodness. Speak good things. Speak things that brings glory to God. You may have a thousand questions in your heart, but speak the praise of your God. Amen? All right. The fourth section is the next section, which is verse 32 to 39. We are learning from Israel's history. That's the, that's the whole point of this psalm. It's a lesson from Israel's history. The fourth stanza shows that even God's mercy was not enough. Even though God showed mercy, they rebelled against him and grieved him in the desert. Rebelled against him and grieved him in the desert. They were a very unbelieving people. God surprisingly did not deal with the people as their hypocrisy deserved. If you and I were there as God, we would have destroyed them long time ago. Now, who needs people like that? Such bad people, such rebellious people, thankless people, full of ingratitude, eh? bad-mouthing all the time. We would have destroyed them long time ago if we were God. Thank God we are not God. You know, God is so gracious, so merciful. Yeah, he did punish some, but he preserved the race completely. Majority of them lived on in spite of their rebellion, in spite of their unbelief. God was merciful. Verse 38 says, he forgave their iniquities. Let's read from verse 32. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in futility and their years in fear. When he slew them, then they sought him. Then they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock and most high God, their redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue. You know, in other words, their repentance is very hypocritical. They flattered him with their mouth, lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him nor were they faithful in his covenant, but he being full of compassion, listen to that, that's what touches me, but he being full of compassion, they're full of rebellion, but he is full of compassion. That's a father's art. When the child rebels, the father has compassion, forgave their iniquity, did not destroy them. That's the truth. People think, you know, God is so cruel that he just, every time you do something wrong, he's going to destroy you. No, he didn't destroy. He didn't destroy them. He had compassion. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. <laughs> For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. <laughs> How beautifully it talks about God's goodness, God's compassion, His forgiveness, and so on. Eh? This is exactly how God has dealt with us. Just think about your life and my life. If God had dealt with us in the way that anybody who knows anything about law or justice dealt with us, we would not be alive and living today, <laughs> right? But thank God, God was merciful. He forgave. If God had not chosen to be merciful to us, we would have all perished a long time ago. But instead of not being merciful and allowing us to perish, God made atonement for our sins by the death of his own son, Jesus Christ. We were such sinners, we deserved to die. <laughs> we deserved to perish. 
instead of punishing us and destroying us completely the israeli people completely deserve to die in the wilderness if you did all the things that god did for the people of israel bringing them out of slavery and all that opening the red sea before them providing the water from rock and manna from heaven <laughs> meat when they wanted if you did all those things and still they rebelled what would you have done we would have caused them to perish but you know what god did he sent his own son he made an atonement for our sins instead of us dying he died on the cross that's the christian gospel that's the most glorious thing about the gospel this forgiveness of god this grace and mercy of god this goodness of god instead of us dying soul that sin shall die the wages of sin is death the bible says we deserved that we were sinners but look who took it his son took it he came and he took it atoned for us by the death of jesus christ his son he forgave our iniquities and a love like this demands a genuine repentance from us see see that is why we believe in genuine repentance because look at a love like this this love demands or deserves i would say genuine repentance if god has so loved us then it is only the right thing for us to genuinely repent and to genuinely follow god truly follow after god in faith and gratitude eh? how many of you genuinely repented eh? truly have come to god and repented and how many of you are true to god following god living for god he deserves that loyalty he deserves that devotion because he died for us to save us gave his life for us died for us many times people don't respond like that you see here that god's love is never wearied god is never tired of loving us that's one thing you read in the old testament with the people of israel and how they behave again and again they even go and worship idols and turn other turn after other gods become totally disloyal and against god and look how god responds to them he is never tired of loving them he puts his anger away his wrath away instead of stirring up his wrath he puts it away and responds with love are you thankful for god's love have you decided to trust in him and live for him be loyal to him uh, every day you should think of this that this kind of love this kind of mercy i should have been dead long time ago but his love and mercy and grace i should have gone to hell long time ago but his love and grace and mercy has made me what i am today you must every day think about that and praise god and every day you must say lord i trust in you i give myself to you I want to follow you truly. I want to live for you. I'm just a human being. I make many mistakes. But I trust in you. Again and again I turn to you. I don't want to go away from you. I want to follow you truly. I want to live for you and be devoted to you because you have loved me so much. Can you say that in prayer today? Can you take that and think about what god has done for you through jesus and the cross you say to him lord i truly repent my repentance is true and genuine i've turned towards you you have forgiven my iniquities you have received me to yourself and i will stay with you lord i will trust you i'll walk with you i'll follow you i'll live for you I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. I give my life into your hands. Would you pray that? Let's all pray that. Oh, thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. 
for you have not consumed us in your wrath. You have put away your anger, sent your wonderful son, Jesus, to die for us on the cross of Calvary, to redeem us, to wash us from our sins, to cleanse us, and to continue to work in us all the time, making us better and better and better, so that one day we'll be able to stand before you spotless, clean, completely perfect. Thank you for your work is going on in us, that you are never tired, you have never wearied, you have not given up, you are not a God who gives up. You are persevering in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our lack of faithfulness many times, in spite of our forgetting you and your goodness. You have stayed with us. You never are wearied in loving us. Thank you, for you never get tired. You love us again and again. You love us more and more. You come after us even after we go away from you. We thank you, Father. You bring us back to yourself. You turn us to yourself. And you bless us. You meet our needs. You're kind to us. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. So we give ourselves to you. Truly we give ourselves to you, to follow you, to love you, to serve you, to be with you. We will not make the same mistake that the people of Israel made again and again. Oh, we will stay with you, Lord. We will stay with you. We will stay with you, Father. We will not test you. Oh, we will not test you, but we will stay with you. We will trust you. Instead of testing you, we will trust you. We will not do what these people did, but we will trust in you, Lord. We will trust in you. May the Spirit of God be our helper. We give ourselves to you. We, we devote ourselves to you, to worship you, to praise you, to live for you, to accomplish your purposes, O oh God. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. And we'll always have deep gratitude for what you've done. Help us to remember that, that we should have deep gratitude. Never, never forget to be full of gratitude. Never forget to be thankful. Oh, let our mouths open up and thank you every day. Every day, every hour of the day, let our mouths be opened up to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for every good thing. Thank you for this best life. Thank you for every good thing. Thank you for your favor, your kindness, your goodness, your mercy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. May the words, thank you, Lord, come out of our mouth every day, every hour, every minute. May it be in our mouth. Every time we sit down and get up, every time we open our mouth to speak, may these words, thank you, Jesus, come out of our mouths, O God. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you. See how we pray? This is the best way to pray, I think. Uh, this way, your prayer is fresh every day. Uh, it's not saying the same thing every day. And uh, Some people pray what they prayed when they were five years old. They're still praying when they're 50 years old. Uh, they learned that prayer. Every day they say, I said my prayers. One man said, I've said my prayers today. Uh, I say it in the morning. I say it. He learned four lines 50 years ago and he's saying it. <laughs> he thinks that's prayer. No, my friend. This is prayer. The word of God comes into this. It inspires us to pray. See, as we meditate on God's word, how it inspires us to pray. How it makes us think of God's goodness. See what it does to us. How it prompts us to pray. How it gives us the words to pray. The words are fresh every time. Next week will not be the same as this week. Uh, today will not be the same as yesterday. Every time it's fresh. You will enjoy praying like this. That is why when you spend time with God, take your Bible and read it, meditate on it, and pray. That's the way to do it. All right. Now, fifthly, the fifth stanza is verse 40 to 45. 
40 to 45. Verse 39 says, he remembered that they were but flesh, that we are just human beings. We are fickle, we are like that. We are fickle-minded. God knows that we are just people. And we are what we are. That this is the way we are. That we need to be worked over. There's a lot of work need to be done. That's what it means. God understands that we were but flesh. A breath that passes away and does not come again. Then verse 40 begins the next stanza, the fifth stanza. And here, verse 40, or verse 40 all the way to verse 72, the end of the psalm. A lot of people say this is just a repetition of what he has already said, what the psalmist has already said. No, it is not. Psalmist is not repeating what he has said. He is telling Israel's story all over again, their experiences all over again, I agree with that, but with greater intensity. He says it with greater intensity. He's on top gear now. <laughs> he first said it, he first narrated their experiences, their rebellion and their ingratitude, their unbelief and all that, but now it's with greater intensity from this point on, you will see. With greater intensity, he talks about people's failure to remember God's miracles of redemption on their behalf. He's already said it, but he says it with greater intensity. Talks all over again about Israel's ingratitude. Beginning with Exodus from Egypt, and the people's failure to remember the miracles of redemption. Yeah. All right, how can they be so forgetful of the wonderful things that God has done? How can they do this? Yeah. How can these people experience so much goodness? It's a lesson for us. It helps us to see the human nature as it is. Yeah. We're all like that. The world is full of people with ingratitude. Thanklessness is not something new. It's not rare. It is rampant. Thanklessness. We're not thankful. Sometimes we forget what good others have done for us. Become thankless. And we forget, most of all, what God has done for us. Just think about that. It teaches a very important lesson. <laughs> and God is so gracious, he says, oh, they're just flesh. <laughs> they're like a wind that blows and never returns, you know. A fickle people, he understands. See how gracious God is. <laughs> it says they've forgotten redemption. Verse 42 says, they did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from their enemy. That's why they provoked him in the wilderness. That's why they grieved him in the desert. That's why they tempted God, as verse 40 and 41 says. That's why they limited the Holy One of Israel. God is not limited, but do you know you can limit God? God is not limited. There is no limit to what God can do. There is no limit to his power, his ability, his wisdom, his greatness. There is no limit. God is limitless God. You believe he's a limitless God? <laughs> and uh, we as human beings, do you also see that we have so many limitations? <laughs> A lot of times, we're not able to go forward because we're limited in our thinking, in our faith, believing God and trusting God. We limit God. We limit God. God is never limited. Don't limit God. God can do great things in your life. If you trust in him, if you abandon yourself to him, if you believe in him, if you go where he tells you to go, do what he tells you to do, he will honor you. He's limitless God. He can open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing like he rained manna from heaven. He can rain blessings upon your life. He's a limitless God. He can bring, just like he brought those fat birds from everywhere and they ate till their, not just the stomach was, was full, but up to here they ate. 
says up to the nostrils it came. That's how they ate. He's a limitless God. He can fill you to overflowing with his blessings. He can meet your need like you'd never imagined. Don't limit him. They limited God, limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. Oh, please remember his power, my friend. Remember God's power. That is why the Bible is so important. When you read the Bible, it reminds us of God's power. What a great God. See, Jesus making the lame walk, blind see, even raises the dead, lepers are cleansed. What great miracles he does. Look at the apostles, how they go forth into ministry and miracles happen. Eh? Literally, they subdued kingdoms of this world. <laughs> Spread the message of Christ and brought kingdoms to Christ. Eh? Whole nations to Christ. That's the way they experience God's power. Did they have trouble? Yeah, a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, wherever they went, they had a lot of trouble. But did they subdue kingdoms? Did they, <laughs> did the whole Roman Empire, was it subdued? <laughs> they were the ones that persecuted Christians in those days, but became entirely Christian later on. The gospel spread all over the world. Because these men were people that believed in the power of God. That God is powerful. That God's power must never be forgotten. I believe in God's power. Because God is powerful. I can stand here and I can preach. If God is not powerful, I have nothing to say. <laughs> I have nothing to preach. I'll go home, do something else. If God is not powerful, then we're all in our sins. No salvation. There's no hope. There's no heaven. <laughs> we will only perish. Because God is powerful. I have a message to share with the world today. Yeah. Don't forget God's power. They forgot what God did. Do we forget what God has done for us? Many times you need to sit back and remember that things that God has done for you, small and great, and celebrate them. One of the greatest things that God has done is He has forgiven you, made you His child. Your redemption is something that cannot be forgotten. Your redemption cannot be forgotten. If you forget what it cost God to redeem us from our sins, what price he paid to redeem us from our sins through Jesus' death, we will not last long trusting in him in our life's trials and tribulations. We will not last. If you will not remember how God redeemed you, from your sins. And if that doesn't seem as a big thing to you, that's why the gospel is so important. If you easily forget what has happened there, you know, if you forget what cost he paid, how much he paid, he paid with his life, not just few rupees, you know, he paid with his life. He paid the price of his own life to redeem us. If you remember that, no trial in life is big. You will never be completely dejected and discouraged. Yeah, trials will come, but you will never give up because he paid the price with his own life. If he died for me, he will do anything for me. If the fact that he died for you does not seem as a big thing, you don't meditate on that, you don't understand that, then you will not be able to trust in him in the midst of your trials. You will not be able to love him and be devoted to him through the problems of life. Why these people were like this? 
They were like this because they forgot. They did not remember. What is the cure? The cure is to remember. That's what this psalm is all about. <laughs> the psalm is all about looking back at history, the things that God has done. See, this is not like other religion. This is based on history, that Jesus is a person. He came and lived in this world, did miracles, died on a cross, rose again, went back into heaven. He's going to come back. This is historically rooted. This gospel is historically rooted. It's based on things that happened here on earth. These people were slaves. They were brought out of slavery, crossed the Red Sea, drank water out of the rock, manna from heaven. God preserved them. It's history. Historical truth. The cure is to remember. That's why we read the Bible. Why we read the Bible? Remember. As you read the Bible, you need to stop and just praise God. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Here, in the list of things that he goes through, he gives the plagues of Egypt, that God brought plagues upon the Egyptians to deliver this people of Israel. He mentioned several plagues, not all of them, but he mentioned six plagues particularly. Why? Because he says, look what God did for you. Look how he shook up the Egyptians. Eh? Now, the Egyptians are still with us. Hello? Are you there? <laughs> Egyptians are not in Egypt. They're everywhere. <laughs> they may be right next to your house. <laughs> they're in your world. They're in your life. The Egyptians that want to enslave you, that want to hinder you, that want to trouble you. The Egyptians are always there. And look what God did to the Egyptians. He turned Nile River's water into blood. He mentions that in Exodus chapter 7, but he mentions that here. The plague of flies is mentioned. The multiplication of frogs is mentioned. Just imagine what all God did. Just imagine how he shook up the nation of Egypt. The whole nation shook as God acted. Locusts is mentioned. Hail is mentioned. Killing of the firstborn is the thing that happened in the last. All of these things, amazing things God did. Every firstborn in their homes were dead. But in the Israeli homes, there was no firstborn dead. There was a lamb dead in their place. Showing that Jesus died in our place. So we can live. What an amazing God he is. What God did to those Egyptians, I believe God will do to our Egyptians today. <laughs> our Egyptians better be careful. <laughs> we feel sorry for people that act like the Egyptians. What God did to the Egyptians, I say to you, my friend, God will, is able to do today. <laughs> he is an ancient God as well as a modern God. He can use modern methods also. Our God will shake up every enemy, every Egyptian, every Egyptian. <laughs> finally will be vexed. The Egyptians finally said, please go. Please leave us, go. We don't want you here, go. <laughs> First they said, we won't let you go. But now they want him to go, want them to go. <laughs> How many of you believe that God is a great deliverer? Let's praise him. Let's worship him. Thank you, Father. Father, you, we thank you. We, we count your blessings and name them one by one. We think about all these things that you've done to the people of Israel. Oh, we think about all the things that you've done to redeem them, to bring them out of Egyptian slavery. We think about what you did to the Egyptians today. And you're able to do it today. Today you're able to do to our Egyptians that we face in this world, oh God. Oh, thank you for giving us victory. Thank you for bringing victory into our lives, oh God. Thank you for victory in the midst of a battle. Thank you for you fight our wars for us. That you stretch forth your hand and things can be done. Even a sea can be split into two. You're a mighty God. 
Oh, help us not to forget that. We remember and we praise you. Help everyone to remember. Let every home, let every family as part of this church remember and celebrate God's mighty acts and deeds. And let it encourage them in the midst of their troubles, in the midst of their challenges in this life. Thank you, Father. We will cross every sea, we will climb every mountain, we will not be hindered by anything that happens in the world because we are here for you, accomplishing your purposes. We give ourselves to you. We pray your blessing upon your people. May these words minister to people. May they be strengthened today in a mighty way. May their discouragements be gone. May they be encouraged, filled with faith. May there be rejoicing in this place and every home and every heart, wherever they are. May there be rejoicing over these things that we looked at today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.